Learning history in school can be quite boring. However, there are quite a lot of things in history that are quite interesting. From the use of lethal dye to a bizarre battle, here are 20 historical facts that will disturb you. Number 20. The Life of Marie Curie Marie Curie, a name that we're all most likely familiar with. Born Maria Sklodowska Curie in Warsaw, Poland in 1876, Marie Curie was a scientist who won a Nobel laureate twice for her contributions in both physics and chemistry. Marie Curie, along with her husband Pierre Curie, discovered polonium, named after her country, Poland, and radium. Both of these are elements that changed how we understood atomic structure and radioactivity. However, her passion also led to her demise. Marie had an unwavering commitment to her research, which came at a cost. The very element that she named and discovered shortened her lifespan as she unknowingly exposed herself to radiation. She died in 1934 after developing a plastic anemia at age 66. Even so, her work laid the groundwork for developing X-rays, cancer treatments, and nuclear energy. However, Marie Curie wasn't the only woman whose life took a dark turn because of radium. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now. Number 19. Radium Girls Marie Curie discovered the element radium in 1898. Almost two decades later, this element would be used as self-luminous paint. In 1917, factories in the United States started employing girls to hand-paint watches that glowed in the dark. This feature was revolutionary at the time, and it wouldn't have been possible without radium. And at a time when mass production of small, detailed objects was impossible without machinery, factories that produced these watches, particularly those in Orange, New Jersey and Ottawa, Illinois, had no choice but to employ women. The true nature of radium was hidden from these workers. Instead of warning the workers to wear protective clothing and minimize contact with the radium paint, they were encouraged to do otherwise. You see, painting the dials led to the brush spreading out. To prevent this from happening, the women were advised to use their lips and their tongues to shape the brush back into a fine point. Believing that the chemical they were handling were safe, the ladies also used it to paint their nails for fun. Those who worked in these factories were literally ingesting radium, a radioactive substance, day in and day out. And if that's not terrifying enough, they were even encouraged to do this by their employers, who touted radium's supposed health benefits. The consequences of radium were harsh. The women began to suffer from a range of severe health issues like anemia, bone fractures, and necrosis of the jaw, a condition horrifically known as radium jaw. But that's not the end of this story. It took years before these health problems and conditions were linked to radium exposure. By the time the radium was found to be the culprit, many of these women were already in dire straits. Despite the complications they endured, these women, in the face of unimaginable suffering, began to fight back. They took their employers to court in a series of landmark cases that not only challenged the companies, but also led to significant changes in labor laws and occupational safety standards. Unfortunately, it took many destroyed lives before laws and regulations were pushed forward for radium. Now, in case you're wondering, the watches that you see today no longer have harmful chemicals. And today, radium has no commercial applications. It's only used in specific applications such as industrial radiography, this marks the tragic history of radium. Number 18. The Woman Who Gave Birth to Rabbits There are stories in history that sound too bizarre to be true. However, all sorts of things happened in the past, and the story of Mary Toft is among the most bizarre. Mary Toft was a woman from Godalming, Surrey, who lived in 1726. Mary became infamous at the time for one strange reason. It was said that she kept giving birth not to newborn human babies, but to rabbits. Now the story goes that after suffering a miscarriage, Mary began to have peculiar deliveries. Local physicians were baffled when they discovered Mary giving birth to baby rabbits. The woman even convinced her own family doctor that something strange was happening to her. Two individuals of the same species can't reproduce an offspring of a different species. That's just how biology works. It didn't take long before other physicians noticed Mary's bizarre case. John Howard, a local surgeon, soon decided to investigate. He observed Mary over several weeks, during which she continued to deliver parts of rabbits. Howard, 
utterly bewildered and convinced, sent word to more prominent doctors and even the king's court about the miraculous rabbit births. It wasn't long before the entirety of England heard about the news from prominent physicians to King George I's court surgeon, Nathaniel St. Andre. Although hoaxes and exaggerated claims were common at the time, many people were quite skeptical about Mary's alleged rabbit offspring. And yet, surprisingly, King George's court surgeon claimed that the case was genuine. This changed the course of Mary's life as she was taken to London to be further observed. So how did Mary convince many smart people that she was birthing rabbits? Well, it turns out Mary was inserting rabbit parts into herself when no one was looking, only to birth them in front of her bewildered audience. Her motive remains unclear to this day. Desperation? Attention? Coping? We'll never know. After several back and forths, experiments, and examinations, the ruse eventually ended. What Mary hoped would garner attention and money led to her being prodded and investigated. Ultimately, she confessed to the hoax, making her story among the most bizarre tales in history. Number 17. Mummy Medicine We've come a long way in understanding human biology, and subsequently the field of medicine. Looking back in history, you'll find the most outlandish and illogical ways of curing the human body. Among the most surprising ways is by using the bodies of the deceased. Yes, you heard that right. Not just ordinary bodies, but mummies. This occurred at the height of the Renaissance. At the time, Europe had a peculiar obsession with mummies, which were ground up into powder. This powder was a panacea for people at the time, a cure-all for a plethora of ailments. This mummified medicine was thought to cure everything from headaches to stomach ulcers. Understandably, mummy, or mumia as it was known, was highly sought after, and, as you can imagine, pretty expensive. Now, where did they get these mummies? Initially, genuine Egyptian mummies were imported. Yes, actual ancient Egyptians ended up in European pharmacies, ground into powder. But as demand soared, supplies dwindled. So what did they do? They started making their own mummies. Criminals, servants, or even donated bodies were mummified specifically for medicinal use. Some were even procured through less savory means. But is there any basis for the usage of mummies? Unfortunately, the whole practice was based on a massive misunderstanding. You see, Europeans got the idea of medicinal mummies from the Arabs, who had indeed used bitumen, which is a kind of asphalt found naturally in the Middle East for medicinal purposes. Europeans thought the black appearance of Egyptian mummies was due to bitumen, not realizing it was actually the result of the embalming process. So they concluded that mummies themselves must possess healing properties. For this reason, in the 16th and 17th centuries, mummia became all the rage in Europe. It was used in tinctures, salves, and even eaten outright. However, as the Enlightenment rolled around, and with it, a better understanding of medicine and science, the use of mummies in medicine fell out of favor. Plus, the whole idea started to seem, well, barbaric. Thankfully, you won't find mummy powder on the ingredient list of your aspirin. Number 16. Nature over Humans Genghis Khan is a name familiar to most of us. After all, he was among the names prominent in the history of mankind. He was known for his tales of conquest, destruction, and battles. One of the lesser-known facts about him, however, is the fact that his conquest eradicated enough people to have a great impact on our planet. Yes, you heard that right. Through the 13th century, his campaigns across Asia not only reshaped the geopolitical landscape, but also, as recent studies suggest, had a significant, albeit indirect, impact on the Earth's climate. You see, Genghis Khan's armies were responsible for the deaths of millions. Historians estimate that the Mongol invasions led to the demise of nearly 40 million people across Asia and Europe. It's a staggering figure that's difficult to comprehend representing vast swaths of humanity at the time. Now, this massive decrease in the human population had an unintended environmental consequence. With fewer people around, vast areas of cultivated land were abandoned and returned to forest. Trees, as we know, are like the Earth's lungs. They absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen, which is crucial in regulating the planet's climate. As these new forests grew, they began to absorb more and more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 
Research in scientific journals has pointed out that the reforestation following the Mongol invasions could have absorbed enough carbon dioxide to make a noticeable mark in the global climate record. In fact, some estimates suggest that the carbon sequestration resulting from Genghis Khan's conquests might have reduced atmospheric carbon dioxide levels by as much as 700 million tons. That's just one of the most unexpected effects of Genghis Khan's conquest in history. Number 15. Ice Cream for the Navy What would motivate you to fight for your country during a major war? Money? Glory? Pure patriotism? That might be a good enough reason for some, but for others, what they wanted was quite simple. Ice cream. Yes, you heard that right. For the U.S., maintaining morale was as crucial as securing victory in battle. And to remedy that, the higher-ups thought of a clever solution. The U.S. Navy used ice cream to lift everyone's spirits. Extraordinary measures were taken to provide soldiers with ice cream on the high seas. It's reported that the Navy purchased a staggering amount of milk powder during the war, primarily for making ice cream for the troops. After that, they created converted barges and ships solely used for making ice cream. One of the most famous was the USS Lexington, which had its own ice cream plant capable of churning out enough ice cream to serve over 5,000 servings daily. Who would have thought, huh? But that's not all. The dedication to providing ice cream to sailors was so intense that there were even reports of an aircraft carrier being converted into a floating ice cream parlor that could produce over 10 gallons of ice cream every 7 minutes. Number 14. Being buried alive in the 18th century. Now here's another bizarre practice that people did in Europe. Aside from a poor understanding of health and medicine, people also had difficulty distinguishing living from the dead. It sounds like the easiest thing to do, but at the time, doctors and physicians lacked the knowledge to judge whether a person was living properly or not. After all, several conditions make it harder to distinguish. The lack of sophisticated medical equipment meant that comas, catalepsy, and other conditions could mimic death closely. To combat this, a new invention was made. Safety coffins. Although seen in America, this invention was observed more across Europe. The idea was simple. If someone found themselves awake in a coffin, they could ring the bell or raise a flag to alert graveyard security guards. These devices became symbols of the collective fear of premature burial, and patents for new designs were filed well into the 19th century. In fact, safety coffins had a market of their own. However, people used more than safety coffins. Some insisted on waiting for signs of decomposition before burial, ensuring the person was truly dead. Others demanded that their hearts be pierced or their bodies mutilated in some way before burial, just to be sure. With the advancement of medicine and science, however, these morbid inventions became obsolete. Number 13. Dentures made of soldiers' teeth Decades ago, losing a tooth or two wasn't exactly something uncommon. Losing teeth was a common problem, and compared to today's dental practices, those of the past were a bit macabre. You see, Dentures today are usually made out of acrylic resin. In the past, however, they were made out of teeth, real human teeth. These teeth were obtained from the deceased soldiers back in the 18th and early 19th centuries. These men were casualties of war, and the dentures produced from their teeth were known as Waterloo teeth. The demand for these dentures was driven by sugar. Yes, the sweet stuff. As sugar became more accessible in Europe, dental problems skyrocketed. The wealthy, who indulged in sugary treats the most, were also the ones who could afford the macabre luxury of wearing dentures made from real human teeth. Number 12. Dead Photography Back in the 19th century, photography was an emerging technology. Unlike today, where we can snap endless digital photos, each photograph back then was precious, often requiring long exposure times and expensive equipment. Now imagine living in a time when the mortality rate especially among children, was incredibly high. Families often had no mementos or visual records of their loved ones. This is where post-mortem photography comes into the picture, quite literally. Post-mortem photography was a popular practice in the Victorian era, especially in Europe and America. It might sound morbid to us now, but for people back then, these photographs were a cherished keepsake of those they had lost. These photographs were taken with the utmost care to portray the deceased as if they were simply asleep, often surrounded by flowers or their favorite possessions. 
Families would dress their loved ones in their best clothing, sometimes even painting eyes onto the photo to give the illusion that they were awake. In the case of children, they might be photographed in their mother's arms or surrounded by their toys. Quite ironically, as photography became more accessible and the mortality rate decreased, the practice of post-mortem photography began to fade. What was once a common and accepted part of mourning gradually became viewed as unsettling or morbid. Number 11. Great Depression The 1930s in the United States were marked by the Great Depression, a time of economic hardship where families across the country struggled to make ends meet. Initially, these sacks were just that, plain burlap bags used to transport potatoes from farms to markets and stores. But as the Depression deepened, families began to repurpose these sacks in creative ways. The fabric was a luxury many couldn't afford, so these burlap sacks were washed, cut, and sewn into clothing, towels, and other household necessities. However, wearing clothes made from potato sacks was often a source of shame for children at school, signaling their family's poverty. Number 10. Deadly Green In the 19th century, this one color stood out for the wrong reasons. This is Scheele's Green, named after the Swedish chemist Carl Wilhelm Scheele, who discovered it in 1775, and later, a variation known as emerald green was also developed. These greens were used everywhere, from wallpapers to dresses and children's toys. Imagine entire rooms and gowns drenched in this lush, vivid green, the epitome of style and affluence. But there was a catch, a toxic one. You see, this dye got its color thanks to arsenic, which as you may know, is a notorious poison. As it turns out, the production process of Shields Green involved arsenic, and lots of it. Now, the Victorians weren't entirely unaware of arsenic's deadly properties, but its risks were grossly underestimated, especially when it came to something as seemingly harmless as color. It wasn't until the turn of the century, with the advancement of chemistry and public health understanding, that arsenic greens were phased out in favor of safer dyes. In fact, to this day, several items from the Victorian era still contain this toxic chemical, and collectors from all over the globe try to obtain it. But this time, they're handled safely. Number 9. Unluckiest Man Tsutomu Yamaguchi was an ordinary engineer. However, in 1945, he became known as one of the unluckiest men in the world. It all began on August 6, 1945. On this day, the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. Coincidentally, Yamaguchi was stationed there at the time. Yamaguchi was just about three kilometers from the bomb's hypocenter when the explosion occurred. Despite suffering severe burns and being temporarily blinded, he survived the initial blast. Imagine the chaos, the confusion, and the terror of such a moment. Surviving something so devastating, thinking it's the worst thing you could ever experience. Little did Yamaguchi know, the ordeal was far from over. After spending a night in Hiroshima, he journeyed back to his hometown. And you won't believe where he was from. Nagasaki. Yes, the very same city that would just three days later, on August 9, 1945, face the second atomic bombing. On that day, Yamaguchi was in the office explaining the destruction he had witnessed in Hiroshima to his boss, who couldn't fathom the idea of a single bomb causing such catastrophic damage. As he described the events, the unimaginable happened again. The second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Twice in three days, Yamaguchi was within a couple of kilometers of ground zero for an atomic explosion, and twice he survived. After Nagasaki, despite his injuries, he continued to search for his family, who thankfully also survived the bombing. Yamaguchi's experiences made him a powerful advocate for nuclear disarmament. He didn't want anyone else to endure what he had, and he dedicated much of his later life to ensuring the world remembered the horrors of nuclear weapons and fought for a future where they would never be used again. Number 8. Books with Human Skin Did you know that there are books out there that are bound with human skin? Yes, you heard that right. However, it's extremely rare, and only a handful exists. One of the most famous examples is the anatomy book bound in the skin of William Burke, one half of the notorious Burke and Hare duo, who were convicted of claiming the life of 16 people in the 19th century to sell their bodies for medical research. 
After being apprehended, his skin was used to bind a book on the very anatomy lectures that his crimes had supported. Scary, don't you think? Number 7. Thomas Edison's Creepy Doll In the late 19th century, Thomas Edison, always the innovator, decided to combine his groundbreaking phonograph technology with something entirely unexpected. Dolls. The idea was revolutionary. Dolls that could actually talk. Edison imagined a new market for his phonographs and an opportunity to make his inventions a staple in homes around the globe. Each doll would contain a miniature phonograph inside its body. When played, it would recite nursery rhymes, bringing the doll to life in a way that had never been seen before. Sounds charming, right? Well, in theory, yes. But the reality was something straight out of a Victorian horror story. These dolls were introduced in 1890. However, the technology had its limits. The sound quality of the phonographs was, by today's standards, incredibly eerie. The recordings were often garbled and distorted, making the dolls sound more like they were chanting incantations rather than reciting Mary Had a Little Lamb. And if the haunting sounds weren't enough, the dolls themselves were not exactly the epitome of cuddly childhood companions. Made with metal bodies and wax heads, they were fragile and, frankly, a bit unsettling to look at. Needless to say, Edison's venture into the toy business was a huge flop. Number 6. The Emu War I bet that the Great Emu War is the weirdest war you'll ever hear about. It all began in 1932. At the time, Australia was struck by the Great Depression. Of course, the ones at the bottom end of the social triangle were affected first. This included the farmers in Western Australia. With the country's economy in shambles, they couldn't afford to put food on their tables. To add insult to injury, a massive flock of emus, Australia's largest native bird, invaded the farmlands. These birds, which can stand up to six feet tall and run up to 30 miles per hour, started wreaking havoc on the crops, particularly wheat when the farmers could least afford it. Now the farmers, many of whom were veterans of World War I, did what any battle-hardened group might consider logical. They called in the military. After careful deliberation, the military concluded they needed to wage war with the big birds. The operation was led by Major G.P.W. Meredith of the 7th Heavy Battery of the Royal Australian Artillery, with soldiers armed with 10,000 rounds of ammunition. Despite the military's firepower, the birds proved to be remarkably resilient, not to mention elusive. The soldiers found that even when they managed to get the emus in their sights, their bullets often did little damage, or the birds would simply scatter and regroup elsewhere. As this quote-unquote war dragged on, Soldiers expended thousands of rounds of ammunition, but the emu population appeared to be undented. Public opinion back home questioned the operation's expense and morality, leading the military to withdraw. By December, the government addressed the issue with a bounty system instead, which proved more effective than direct military action. Ironically, today, the emu is Australia's national bird. Number 5. Don Pedro Pedro I of Portugal is also known as Pedro the Cruel or Pedro the Just, depending on who you ask. Although considered a royal, he had an affair with his wife's very own lady-in-waiting. His lover's name is Inés de Castro. Pedro and Inés's affair was no secret, and it stirred not just gossip, but also political unrest. Inés was of Castilian nobility, and her growing influence over Pedro threatened the balance of power. Fearing a political alliance with Castile through Inés, the king, Afonso IV, Pedro's father, decided that drastic measures were needed. In 1355, under the guise of protecting the crown and the country, Afonso ordered the assassination of Inés de Castro. Pedro was devastated. The love of his life was gone, taken by the hands of his own father. But Pedro's love for Inés was as stubborn as it was passionate. He couldn't let her memory fade into the shadows of history. This was when he did the unthinkable. The story goes that after he ascended to the throne, Pedro declared that he and Ines had been secretly married, and therefore, she was the rightful queen of Portugal. It didn't end there. Pedro also allegedly had Ines's body exhumed and placed upon a throne, dressed in the regalia of a queen. The court and the nobles were commanded to pay homage to their new queen, to kiss the hand of the corpse bride. 
I guess this is just one of the few things people have done for love. Number 4. The Lost City of Roanoke Roanoke was the first permanent English settlement in North America. At least, it was initially intended to be one. However, something strange happened to these people that remains unexplained to this day. John White, the governor of the colony, returned to England for supplies shortly after establishing the settlement. His departure was supposed to be a short one. After getting delayed, he came back to Roanoke after three long years. But as White reached the land in 1590, he stumbled upon something bizarre. He found no people on the island. The colony was deserted. The buildings were dismantled, and there was no sign of a struggle or haste. The only clue to the settlers' fate was the word Croatoan carved into a wooden post and Crow etched into a tree. The Croatoan were a Native American tribe living on a nearby island, which led some to speculate that the colonists might have sought refuge with them. But searches of the area yielded no sign of the English settlers. They had vanished without a trace, leaving behind one of the greatest mysteries in American history. Number 3. H.H. Murder Castle In the late 19th century, Chicago was a booming city, rapidly expanding and full of opportunity. Naturally, Several investors around the area took advantage of this to establish profitable buildings. One of them is H.H. H. Holmes. Holmes was a con artist and a bigamist, but most notoriously, he would become known as one of America's first serial killers. Holmes built a hotel designed to attract visitors to the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. However, in reality, it was a labyrinth filled with traps designed by Holmes himself to disorient, trap, and ultimately claimed the lives of his victims. The upper floors contain Holmes' living quarters, and a maze of over 60 rooms with no consistent layout. Some doors open to brick walls, staircases leading to nowhere, and a series of chutes that led to the basement. The basement itself was equipped with a dissecting table, a crematorium, and vats of acid, tools Holmes used to dispose of his victims' bodies. Some victims were suffocated in their rooms, which were outfitted with gas lines that Holmes could control. Others were locked in soundproof rooms and left to die of starvation or dehydration. The actual number of Holmes' victims remains unknown, with estimates ranging from a dozen to over a hundred. It was only in 1894 when Holmes was finally caught. Strangely enough, it wasn't for the lives he claimed, but for horse theft. It wasn't until two years after this arrest that he was finally tried, convicted, and executed for his crimes. Number 2. Ketchup as Medicine Tomato ketchup is one of the leading condiments in the world today, but that wasn't what it was known for in history. It's hard to believe, but tomato ketchup was actually sold as medicine in the 1830s. It was first introduced by Archibald Miles through Dr. Miles' compound extract of tomato. He claimed that this ingredient isn't something that's limited to cooking. On the contrary, it's meant to be a cure-all for ailments like indigestion, jaundice, and rheumatism. The concept of selling ketchup as a health remedy took off, and soon, other manufacturers jumped on the bandwagon, concocting their own versions of medicinal ketchup. They claimed these tonics could cure everything from baldness to athlete's foot. Yes, back in the day, someone slathered ketchup on their head, hoping to grow hair. Scientifically speaking, however, tomatoes do have a lot of benefits as an ingredient, Tomatoes have vitamin A and C, and they also contain lycopene, an antioxidant linked to many health benefits. However, the medicinal ketchup of the 1800s was a far cry from being a scientifically proven remedy. The claims were primarily based on anecdotal evidence. With that being said, placebo and over-exaggeration were common. As the 19th century wore on, the Pure Food Act of 1906 brought a wave of regulations that cleaned up the claims made by food and medicine producers. This marked the end of ketchup's brief stint as a miracle cure, relegating it back to its rightful place as a beloved condiment. And now, it's time for today's topic. Here's a lesser-known historical fact that will disturb you. Marilyn Monroe is among the greatest figures in the history of media. She lived a life in the spotlight, and she was always under scrutiny. However, Beneath all the glamour was a painful secret. Marilyn always had a tough life. After being orphaned by her parents at an early age, she was left on her own. Her success in stardom allowed her to support herself, but this also led her to be exploited. Her life continues to be shrouded in mystery, 
with some fabricating stories about her. To this day, Marilyn remains a historical figure who proved that fame won't give an individual happiness or peace. Number 1. Salem Witch Trials In the past, if you were sarcastic, you could get accused of being a witch. But that's not all. If you slammed the church door loudly, you'd also be a witch, as people believed that slamming it meant you were closing the door with the devil's steady hand. If you lifted something heavy and succeeded, you would also be accused of dabbling with black magic to gain more power. Now kids also had great imaginations, so if your child said something about you being a witch, you were done for. And if you somehow placed a jinx on your enemy, you were also accused of witchcraft. If you argued with someone and they ended up in a bad situation later on, you were seen as a witch. These were only some of the few ordinary things that could get you accused of being a witch at the height of the witch trials. The year was 1692, and the place was the Puritan settlement of Salem. The Puritans were a group with strict religious beliefs, and their society was one where the supernatural was very much a part of their everyday fabric of life. People saw witches as real dangerous entities. The trials began with a group of young girls who claimed that they were being pinched, bitten, and tormented by invisible forces. The girls accused several local women of bewitching them, and the wildfire of accusations began to spread. The first accused were Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and a woman named Tatuba. Imagine being convicted because someone said they saw your ghostly double misbehaving. It sounds absurd, but that's exactly what happened. Over 200 people were accused. 19 were hanged. One was pressed to death under heavy stones, and several others died in jail, all victims of fear, superstition, and a justice system that today seems anything but just. To this day, this remains one of the most painful and darkest parts of history. The video might have ended, but let's keep the discussion going in the comments down below. If you know about other bizarre or lesser known historical facts, feel free to leave them in the comments. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on the screen right now, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everybody.